Okay, so we will go ahead and get started. And apologies for the delay, everyone. We're having a little bit of a tech issue with one of our panelists. Um, but we thank you for joining the um, second Advancing Criminal Justice with a Latinx Lens uh, convening. And today's session that's gonna be focused on specifically uh, youth justice. So despite uh, continuing national declines in youth arrests and detentions and incarceration rates across the country, um, we know that there are still persistent and stubborn racial disparities that exist within the criminal justice system, specifically as it relates to our young people. Um, as communities of color continue to drive uh, demographic growth in um, large states, small states, and across the country, uh, um, we know that it is more important than ever to identify models that are innovative, that are really putting forward uh, alternatives to discipline alternatives to incarceration that are truly focused on supporting the growth and the uh, promise and the potential of our young people with every institution that they encounter, uh, not just our K-12 public education systems, but uh, our health systems, our systems for uh, continued education, higher education, uh, and specifically the ways that we interact with our criminal justice system, of course. Um, so we are joined today by two really incredible thought leaders in the field. Uh, I'll first introduce uh, James Brodick, who's the Director of Community Development and Crime Prevention at Center for Court Innovation. Uh, James leads the center's work on a range of community development and crime prevention initiatives in New York City, including the Brownsville Community Justice Center, Harlem Community Justice Center, Queens Youth Justice Center, Neighbors in Action, Cure Violence, uh, and the Mayor's Office of Safety Initiatives. James leads a team of senior staff members to define a vision for the center's involvement in community-based crime prevention and to ensure its work remains at the cutting edge of the field. James is also responsible for implementing a range of data-driven methods to measure the effectiveness of our crime prevention work. And since joining the center in 1998, he's led uh, numerous leadership roles, including uh, serving as director of NYC Community Courts, the Red Hook Community Justice Center, which is a really exceptional model, uh, and the New York City Community uh, Cleanup, uh, and was also a planner and inaugural director for the Brownsville Community Justice Center. He's a graduate of St. John's University uh, and a New York State certified mediator. And next up, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Nina Salomon, who is a program director at Corrections and Reentry at the Council of State Governments uh, Justice Center. Uh, Nina is uh, in her capacity supporting states and counties across the country to develop, adopt, and implement legislative and other policy changes to reduce recidivism and improve youth outcomes. She also leads the organization's efforts on improving educational and employment outcomes for youth and young adults involved with the juvenile justice system, including reducing the use of exclusionary discipline. Previously, she was a policy advisor at Education Council LLC, a national policy and legal consulting firm where she aided clients at state and local education agencies and national organizations to advance policy change. Uh, she's also conducted research and written policy briefs and funding uh, guides to support youth development organizations uh, ma in managing grants at local education foundations. Nina has earned a BA in political science from the George Washington University uh, and a master's in education and uh, policy from the University of Pennsylvania. So thank you both for uh, again, taking the the time to join us, and uh, we we greatly look forward to uh, speaking with you. And I'll I'll start with uh, just a, a broader question, um, and that is, in uh, using data in this in this effort in this movement around youth justice um, to measure the effectiveness of justice reform, uh, that continues to be a through line in all of our work. But we know that there are significant gaps in what the data can tell us about racial inequities in our system. Uh, so we'd love to start with just a broad question on how in your respective capacities and the jurisdictions in which you work, um, how are gaps uh, or what are some of the gaps that you've seen in data collection and how do they obscure the impact that the system has had on uh, young people of color, Latinos, uh, indigenous and other uh, communities of color. So we'll start there and uh, I'll, uh, if, we, if we can begin with um, Nina. Um, sure. Uh, thank you, Paul, and uh, really excited to, to be here uh, with James to talk about this issue. Um, so as Paul mentioned, we at the Council of State Governments Justice Center work with states and counties around the country 
to help them assess their juvenile justice systems from point of referral all the way through reentry. Um, and we do that by trying to access uh, case level juvenile justice data from across the system. Um, and as Paul alluded to, that is increasingly, um, or not increasingly, but has always been a, a significant challenge um, for, for a number of reasons. Um, data uh, collection in states on juvenile justice varies significantly um, in terms of the ability to collect data on every decision point um, across the juvenile justice system, you know, who's coming into contact with the system, um, who's arrested, what happens to youth as they move through the juvenile justice system, whether they are um, diverted or adjudicated, <clears throat> what their disposition, what are their outcomes look like. Um, there are only a, probably a few or a handful of states that we can think of that really do have comprehensive data collection systems that can help policymakers and, and agency leaders um, really answer key questions and really basic questions at times about how their juvenile justice system is performing and more importantly, how youth are faring. What do youth outcomes look like um, and, and are they successful? Um, oftentimes we see recidivism as the only indicator measuring success, but we know um, it's really important to look at positive youth outcomes. Are youth, um, uh, what are their educational outcomes? Are they getting employment? What about behavioral health and family engagement? These are all really critical measures uh, to look at when we're trying to think about success. Um, we also know that um, when we're looking at juvenile justice data in states and counties, it's not just that it varies in terms of how data is entered. Um, people are not defining things <laughs> similarly across the juvenile justice system. Um, but also when it comes to trying to um, look at or measure disparities, um, a lot of states are not disaggregating data by race and ethnicity at each of these critical decision points, um, especially when it comes to the Latino or Native populations. A lot of that information is either self-identified or that information is categorized very broadly um, and not looked at in terms of the different um, populations that may exist within that particular race or ethnicity. And so it's really hard to get a broad picture of what's happening to different populations, different communities as they move across the juvenile justice system. A lot of times beyond just race and ethnicity, most of these juvenile justice data uh, systems cannot um, tell policymakers or state leaders about what's happening geographically in certain counties or certain jurisdictions so that you can pinpoint where there may be particular needs by, by various communities. Um, so it presents a challenge um, for us when we come into a state, but what a, one of our goals is to help um, state leaders, agency leaders, local leaders really try and look at what disparities exist. Everybody knows that there is disproportionality. It's not a surprise to anyone in the states and counties that we work in, but putting that data as much as we can to the extent that it's available front and center, really make sure that they confront that um, head on um, and helps them think about what policies and practices they can implement that really directly and indirectly get at disparities. But I think there are some core issues around data collection that need to be addressed, whether that's infrastructure, whether that's thinking through definitions and protocols for how data is entered. How do we make sure that different communities are represented in that data in an accurate way? I think there are a lot of data challenges that, that currently exist in the juvenile justice system. And James, do, do your, your background working both in uh, civil society as well as in, in government, um, how, how has this issue of the, the lack of the dearth of, of uh, data in aggregate forms that is um, meaningfully enlightening and representative of the, of the reality in which our young people are impacted by these institutions, how has that come forward? What are some of the strategies that, that New York has advanced around um, uh, disaggregation, tracking analysis that, uh, that uh, we can sort of lift up? Yeah. Well, and first of all, thank you so much for for allowing me to be part of this uh, this panel. I really appreciate. Um, you know, it's interesting. You know, New York wants to take a lot of credit for being so progressive when it comes to a lot of criminal justice initiatives and movements. But only till a couple of years ago did we raise the age where um, until until recently, 18 year olds under 18 were going to criminal court. 
And in some ways, it actually made collecting data easier uh, for that age group, for, for the 16 and 17 year olds, because in criminal, in criminal courts, it was much easier for us to access. And a lot of the initiatives that were moved forward under previous administrations here in the city was around that age group of 16 to 24, who historically have been the drivers of a lot of violent crime. And so <clears throat> for, for f almost going on about seven, eight years now, that's really been our emphasis on identifying what are the touch points where that age group is touching systems and not only the criminal justice system, because I think I think what happens in our work is we narrowly look into only the data that we have access to. Um, we have started to tap into uh, Department of Education data. We've started to tap into many other avenues to try to identify who are the young people who are at the tipping point of touching many systems, whether it's child welfare, whether it's whether it's uh, the DOE and suspensions. So we we have tried to, especially for the younger age group, figure out new ways of trying to get access. Frankly, what has caused us as an organization to do is the Center for Court Innovation has been around for 25 years. And initially, we were really hired by the unified court system to say, we have a system that doesn't work. The first recognition and reform is recognizing something doesn't work. And our chief judge at the time was phenomenal and said, what can we be doing better? And that's that's when the creation of drug courts, mental health courts, domestic violence courts, and then ultimately community courts started to become very popular. And the whole idea around it is if we couldn't get the data, let's be in the neighborhoods that have been most impacted by the criminal legal system so we can have a hands-on view of what was going on. So maybe we couldn't always match the numbers, but we knew who were who were likely to be arrested. When those cases were coming, they were coming into the justice centers in front of a single prosecutor, a single judge, uh, the same probation officers. And so we really made a decision years back to say it's not good enough to just wait for folks to come and look at the data, but we already know where what communities are driving a lot of the violence and crime. We know where it's been disproportionate, not only in regards to the criminal justice system and the overbearing of the criminal justice system, but the under under value, our educational system has failed many of those communities. We talk about poverty. And so we have just made a decision um, using data, frankly, to identify 10 neighborhoods in New York City where we have full-time staff working there all the time, hiring locally, and, and are trained to both identify young people who touch the system and then identify clicks, sets, and crews where they're likely to touch the system. And that's where we offer a lot of our interventions. So, you know, when, when, when I think about the work in New York City, we're trying to do reform work on the system side of it and transformation work on the community side of it. Yeah, and if, if I can say on that point, uh, James, as we you know, as we think about overcoming systemic structural challenges to the youth justice system, the terms uh, reform and transformation sometimes are used interchangeably. So I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about what is meant by each of these terms and why those distinctions matter. You know, it's it's funny when I when I talk about reform where I talk about a lot of like the anti-violence movements, I often think about it's the emergency room of the hospital. It's triage. Something is happening in real time, there's a crisis, and we need to deal with it. But we're not talking about healthy lifestyles and dieting and exercise, all the things that the medical field is way ahead of the criminal justice field. And so, so basically what we're saying with reform is there's an identification that the system that exists doesn't work. There's definitely hiccups along the way. And reform is really about creating, at least from the way we look at it, a more humane and just system but really what we're saying is how does this system that caused more harm, right? It's a harm, it's almost a harm reduction model. But when we think about transformation, transformative justice, we talk about vibrancy and community health. The idea, you know, it's it's interesting. This last year, as I saw the pendulum swing where we were going from defund the police or abolish the police, and now we're talking communities where now we're talking about more policing, right? The criminal justice system is driven on fear, not just data. And as a result, what we've talked about with transformative justice is that if we have communities that are dealing with real issues around poverty, racial justice issues, we're coming up with, I love what Nina talked about, it's, it's not about just resolving a case and seeing if whether a young person recidivates or not, but are we putting them on a track where the trajectory of their lives have changed? Are they becoming, are they going and re-enrolling in school? Are they getting jobs? Do they feel like, frankly, do they have hope? 
and a belief that things can change in their neighborhood. And, and so when we talk about it, we look at the young people who many folks have considered the troublemakers of a neighborhood and identify them as the leaders of change. Young people understand not only the, the systems really well, they understand their neighborhoods better than all of us. They understand why they navigate the way they do. They understand why they ha how they, they understand safety and what's not safe. And what we've never done is offered them the tools to think about ways that they can help solve local problems. The best that we've done for a long, long time is telling them how to interact with the police versus saying, how can they be urban designers, city planners, criminologists, uh, using technology to solve local issues. So I say what transformation means to me is that you have communities that are working. And communities that are working, it's a, it has a working economy. There's, there's, we reduce trauma. There's, a, there's a, less of a need of systems. And that's really what we're working towards. So when I, when I say, or when we talk about reform here, we talk about a system reducing harm. When we talk about transformation, we talk about a community that no longer needs the system. Thank you so much, James, for those for those really helpful insights. Um, Nina, I had a, a question for you about some of the work that you do across the state uh, in supporting states and counties in the development and implementation of legislative measures to improve youth outcomes. Uh, in your experience, what have been some of the most promising reforms that you've seen at the local level uh, that really preserve the futures of Latinx and other youth of color, uh, but also address the disproportionate involvements that these communities have in uh, juvenile incarceration? Um, sure. Um, yeah, so uh, the work that we do in states um, and, and some at the county level as well in, in local jurisdictions um, is we try and partner with statewide task forces that consist of stakeholders from across the juvenile justice system, across the state, from different perspectives. Um, and we try and make sure that communities are centered in those discussions. Um, not just by providing inputs, like tell us your stories, tell us what your experiences are with the justice system, but making sure that those young people, those families, those communities that are most impacted by the justice system are part of the solution development process. Um, and that's been a learning experience for us as an organization, to be honest. We are a justice uh, system focused organization. We are an association of state level policymakers. And so working more at the community level is something that has been um, newer for us and, and kind of a, a learning experience. And, and we have seen how that can play out and, and be more um, impactful in some of the reforms and legislative initiatives that we've seen adopted and implemented in the, in the last several years. Um, a couple of the things that we, um, examples that I can share about some of the reforms um, or improvement efforts, as we, we call them, that we have uh, passed in the last several years. And one of them I'll talk about um, from the perspective of Connecticut, since I know we were, we were going to have a panelist from Connecticut, so I will share her, her example. But we work closely with the state of Connecticut, who is definitely more, more progressive, has adopted and implemented a number of improvement um, through legislation in the last several years. Um, but one of the things that we looked at um, for Connecticut is while they had really good data, um, they weren't necessarily um, looking at data across not just the justice system, but I think, as James said, across other service systems, across different types of agencies working with young people to really identify what are not just the disparities, but what does equity look like? What are the different measures that we should be looking at to measure equity across our justice system um, and across how youth are, are being treated, responded to, et cetera? And so as a result of the work that, that we did in partnership with um, the Tau Youth Justice Center and, and others in Connecticut, they have developed an equity data dashboard um, where data from multiple agencies are inputted into a data dashboard, the goal being that there would be real-time data available um, to state and local leaders, to policymakers, to answer key questions about equity across the youth justice system. Um, that is, that's one example of going beyond just how many youth of color of these different race, ethnicity groups are part of the juvenile justice system at various decision points, these are equity measures. Like how is the system responding to and treating um, and supporting young people differently um, across, across the juvenile justice system? Um, the other thing that uh, we've done in, in a couple of different states is help um, people think through um, 
you know, how to prioritize resources in a way that can help target directly and indirectly um, communities of color um, and, and overall improvement in the juvenile justice system. So, for example, um, a lot of the time in, in the states and counties we work in, the big focus um, for, for these communities is how do we reduce incarceration, right? That's been a huge focus across the country. Let's get kids out of these facilities. But nobody's really been thinking about the front end of the juvenile justice system, how kids get into the, the system in the first place. What does that initial interaction look like? Why are these kids coming into contact with the system? What are the root causes? Um, and so one thing that we've helped states think about is while you're reducing your incarceration rates, that's great, but most of the kids are not incarcerated. They are either on probation um, in some way, oftentimes for, for one or two years. Let's think about how to get these kids away from the system in the first place and divert them to other youth service systems, other community-based services that are closer to home that really uh, target their individual needs that might have gotten them involved in the system in the first place. And so we've worked with a number of states to expand diversion opportunities um, that are at various levels, whether that's at the school level, law enforcement level, pre-court level, um, to really make sure that kids that are just being kids, kids that are doing typical adolescent behavior, committing very low level offenses, are not put further downstream in the juvenile justice system. Um, from a policy perspective, it doesn't make any sense and it's an inefficient use of resources. From a public safety perspective, it doesn't make sense. And from a youth outcomes perspective, it doesn't make sense. Um, so we've helped another, a number of states, Connecticut being one of them, Colorado. We're currently uh, have legislation pending in Indiana that ex expands uh, juvenile diversion opportunities across the state to make sure that young people are served in their communities closer to home with resources and providers and, and staff that know these young people and families best and that they don't have to be under court supervision in order to get access to these services. Um, so that, those are two examples of ways that we've tried to um, target, I guess, juvenile justice improvement efforts and, and really help reduce those, those disparities. Because we know that with disparities, they, they start manifesting at that first initial point of contact, um, whether it's exclusionary discipline, whether it's law enforcement interaction, that initial point of contact with the justice system is where we see disparities, you know, manifest themselves at the justice level. And then they just exacerbate as you get further and further into the justice system. So we want to try and interrupt that at the initial um, initial point of contact. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to add some because what Nina talked about is really is really important. There's this there's a system that's identified that we want to reduce the use of incarceration, detention, and then there's this group of youth based or community based organizations who want to serve young people, but they don't always want to serve the young people who are at highest risk or young people who have a history of slipping up along the way. And I think what we need to figure out is as folks who are either supporting community based organizations, funding some of them, is how do we train these organizations that there's a major benefit to working with young people who may be more at risk and they may have slip ups along the way, but creating programming where failure is not an option. Um, you know, I, I tell I tell my team all the time, if a young person is not coming into the site, they're speaking with their feet. That means what we are offering does not resonate with them. So what do we need to do? Leave our offices. We know where the young people hang out. Identify what are the challenges that are really facing this community. Programming for programming's sake is actually not worth it. You can't just offer job job training programs for careers that, that there's no jobs for. It actually creates this setup for people to believe that the system does never, never works. So one of the things that I would challenge anybody who's doing community-based work here is if you indeed do want to work with young people who've been involved in any of these systems, specifically the criminal justice system, I think it's really important to understand that so many folks have failed them along the way that developing programming that is all about building on successes and continuing to support them even when they're, they're falling off a bit is super critical. Otherwise, we're just going to keep spinning our wheels. Thank you. I, I do want to touch on um, this really interesting question or idea that that both Nina and James spoke to, which was 
uh, both the idea of resources and also ecosystems where uh, young people's involvement in the justice system is often a product of uh, a series of failures from various institutions in, in our broader governing institutions and in, in our ecosystems and in the, in the education system as well. Um, so, so we know, right, investments in the communities that uh, most populate the justice sector uh, is often outside of the purview, uh, almost always outside of the purview of the justice sector, uh, and that racial and ethnic disparities across all human service sectors are often exacerbated by siloed departments, by uh, funding streams that don't uh, understand the, the nuances and the needs of directly impacted communities and mandates and programs. Uh, we also know that the desired results are often determined by the folks who are furthest from uh, directly experiencing these issues, these problems, and that accountability measures uh, are usually just about process and not really about improving uh, quality of life and improving outcomes. So my question to you both is how, how, do, we, um, how do we disrupt current ways of doing business in order to reduce the race effects in the administration of justice, um, but also in other human service sectors. Um, and, and how about we start with uh, Nina on that question? Sure. Um, I think I talked about a, a, some of this a little bit before, but I'll, I'll expand. Um, I think there's uh, probably four different ways that I can think of. Um, one is the data piece. So really investing in data infrastructure, but really thinking through what are those performance measures? How are we going to hold the justice system and other systems accountable for getting better outcomes for kids? And what does better outcomes mean? What are we looking for the system and other systems to do? Um, whether that is, you know, recidivism, whether that is employment or education or behavioral health outcomes, um, whether that's performance measures for particular initiatives or programs, we have to make sure that we're holding programs, providers, um, individuals and systems accountable for the work that they're doing with young people and families. And often what we see in the states that we work in is that there are no performance measures. There's no quality assurance protocols around procurement and, and funding of some of these providers and, and programs and services. Um, there aren't, uh, um, there's no oversight. Um, a lot of these programs get a certain, you know, amount of dollars and they just keep working with young people, but they're not targeted. Um, there aren't um, mechanisms or oversight structures to really hold them accountable. Um, and that leads into the second, which is really targeted use of dollars. Um, you know, we, for example, we're just working in, in a state, and I won't name it, that um, had a big pot of money for juvenile justice services, for um, supervision and service agencies to provide services for youth that are in the justice system. And there were no parameters. They really could use those dollars for anything. And so making sure that those dollars are targeted for the use of research-based or evidence-based programs and services, that there's opportunities for innovation um, and flexibility to, to be able to address the distinct needs of youth in particular communities or areas, that there's funding for research and evaluation to make sure that programs are actually having the intended impact. Um, we know that there are there's a lot of research on evidence-based programs or practices for, for kids in the justice system, but there isn't a lot in terms of what works for youth of color in the justice system. And so we have to be able to adapt policy, um, programs and services for particular communities and make sure that they are um, improving outcomes. Um, the other thing is, is, as you mentioned, is cross-systems collaboration. Um, we know that youth in the justice system are often involved in other service systems. They're in education. Um, you know, I think it's upward of 60% of youth in the justice system have behavioral health issues. Obviously, the crossover with the child welfare or so social services system. And so these kids don't operate in silo, the families don't operate in silo, and the communities don't operate in silo. And the justice system cannot be expected to do it alone. Um, we see in a number of states and counties um, where the justice system is really seen as the de facto mental health system because those services are not available for, for one reason or another, whether that's funding or, or insurance or certain other barriers um, for youth, except for if they get into the justice system. We were working in a state that um, kids were getting into the justice system just to get access to certain um, more intensive treatment opportunities because without an open case, they couldn't get those services. 
Um, so really making sure that there is collaboration in funding, collaboration in um, accountability, collaboration in services um, across all of these uh, different systems. Um, one other example to highlight that is, is we did an analysis um, recently in Colorado of how the workforce development system was involving youth and young adults with justice uh, system um, involvement in you know, funding and services and programming and opportunities. And we found that you know, across all of these systems, no one was talking to one another, whether that was juvenile justice, Department of Corrections, um, the criminal justice system, workforce development, post-secondary education, everybody was siloed. And as a result, youth and young adults with justice system involvement were not prioritized at all because they weren't talking to one another. They didn't have seats at each other's tables. Funding was what funding streams flowed individually to, to those different systems. Um, and so it's really important to have that collaboration because not one system can, can do it alone. Yeah, there, there's a bunch of yes, 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 I would be saying to you right now, you know, and and the who, um, you know, I, I often say, you know, especially when we look at who is the gatekeeper of the criminal justice system, which tends to be law enforcement. And I think about how law enforcement in New York City works is they identify high crime communities. They flood them with very inexperienced police officers to try to deal with this issue around crime and safety. And, and, and frankly, if you followed me when I was 13 years old, you probably could have arrested me every day of the week. If there's enough eyes on a young person and you want to find something that they're doing, you will find it. And, and I find that across the board, when we talk about the communities that we spe specifically serve in, we talk about inexperienced police officers, inexperienced teachers. We, we have challenges that our families and young people are facing that our system is ill-equipped to handle. And I don't, you know, when we talk about cross-collaboration, it's like, it, it has to be a constant flow of these systems talking together to best serve this person. And not that they're going from one thing to another to another. We set up appointments that are that are that we're actually double dipping on we have them wasting a lot of time a lot of energy and they're not coming up with good outcomes and so you know we can talk until we're we're blue in our face but i do think that the investment also has to be in who are the people who are responsible for providing the service as well as are we serving the right individuals thank you both um i i want to i want to Kind of turn to a, a more more uh, it's a broader scale, somewhat philosophical question, uh, but I think an important one that really frames this this discussion, and, and that is um, for for you both in, in your respective roles, what does a transformed vision for public safety that meaningfully, authentically centers communities and young people look like? Um, and maybe James, we could start with you, and, and we'll turn to Nina. Yeah, you know, centering community has become such a popular term. I feel like centering community and credible messengers is the two popular terms of, of the last two years. And, and, and both are valuable, but when overused, it loses its potency. Um, you know, I, I, I can't tell you how many times uh, I, I sit with groups and they talk about community engagement. And the only thing that they do is they go to a tenant association uh, meeting or a police council meeting, and they talk to a bunch of 50 and 60 year olds about the community and their challenges. But when are we going to start talking to young people? So when you when we talk about transforming communities, I, I first feel like we need to start with how do we heal communities? Communities have been harmed for, for a very, very long time. And there's healing. You know, we, we talk about systems. You know, it's very easy how we point fingers at systems. But within communities, there's a lot of distrust and healing that needs to happen. You know, I, I, was, I was saying on our prep call that I can be in Brownsville, Brooklyn, seven o'clock one night and hear a bunch of folks talk about how we need more police and they feel unsafe. Usually it's the older population. And then the next morning go into one of our youth centers and young people are talking about how to be an over harassed, over policed and, and discriminated against. And both of those statements are true to those folks, to those individuals. And so how do we start to create a community where that trust is built first? and then collectively move because i can't tell you how many times elected officials are, are responding and saying well this is what community wants it's a percentage of the community that, that wants one piece of what you collected so what we've tried to do and and you know when we talk about centering community we have decided that we the, the folks who've been most impacted by the systems should be the agents of change to fix it and whether that's talking about 
uh, how do I, we do placemaking and placekeeping where we reimagine how places and spaces are used and taking back hotspots. That's an example. If we talk about real engines of economic mobility and starting up merchants associations that hire, that agree to hire locally and train young people, that starts transforming. If we talk about, we have to also talk about access to housing. Um, and and that is a big piece of, especially now coming, you know, in, in the next few months, you know, we are going to have, we're going to be on the brink of a lot of people who are, who are really far behind in rent arrears, where that's going to be a major, major issue. So transforming communities is both identifying the issue, healing, but then offering programming that really changes it. And, you know, I was critical earlier about job training programs. I was critical only because what they do is they train people to get minimum wage jobs for a short period of time, but we don't make investments in creating a workforce that's desirable. And a lot of times we don't make that investment is because the communities, especially community-based organizations, don't have the resources to keep up with the workforce world at the same time. So to do this work and that invite the technology world into it, to not invite the business world into it, we need to, everybody wants to be woke. Everybody wants to put out statements after somebody gets, you know, somebody gets killed. After George Floyd, everybody was putting out something. Now it's time to put your money where your mouth is. Let's make a commitment to deal with racial in injustice, economic injustice, environmental injustice, and let's really make those commitments and those dollars. And what I believe, and to Nina's point, is dollars with a return on investment. Like, like we, and these folks do that well, and that we should be investing in our communities, and that money should be doubling down for the next group of people. Um, and, and, then, and just lastly, you know, as I think about foundations who have been really good for us to work with, you know, a lot of times when a government puts out an RFP, you know, the best practice is sometimes few years old. I think there's a combination of best practices and you really need to have kind of innovation, this ability to implement and pivot and try things out and say this doesn't work and be honest to, to go to funders and talk about what those things are. So transformation is community owning their data community owning their stories, community owning what what they see as change. And our responsibility as outsiders is to provide them with all of the tools. You know, people like to use the term, those closest to the problem, the closest to the solution. Well, the solution they're closest to is the ones they know. Our responsibility is to bring more solutions to the table and then train the community up so they now have the ability to solve more problems with more tools. And so that to me, when I think transformation is when a community, frankly, don't need systems like we all work for. So I'll be honest, I think what James started out the conversation with is, is kind of what we have done in the past um, in terms of what we meant by community engagement. You know, we would go into a state or a jurisdiction and host a couple listening sessions and say, OK, we got information. Um, we're going to incorporate this into our recommendations somehow and Thank you so much. Um, you know they've been they've been the inputs. Please tell us your stories. Please share your experience. Um, a couple sessions, and then we're 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 good. And I think we've realized over the last couple of years, especially, and and we're trying in the in the states and counties that we're working in now, is what actually is meaningful community engagement, and how do you do that well when you're a state at the state policy level? I think it's much easier to think about when you're trying to work at the community or county or local jurisdiction level than thinking about at the state or, or state policy level. Um, and so we've tried to do that in, in a couple different ways. And, and by no means do I feel like we're there in terms of, you know, what is authentic um, and meaningful um, engagement. But I think there's a couple things that we've been doing. Um, one is ensuring on these state level task forces or oversight bodies that are actually developing policy or holding systems accountable is to make sure that there is diverse representation um, across systems, across race, ethnicities, um, across perspectives, including people with lived experiences from different communities, being uh, having a seat at the table, but also arming them with information so that they can provide a, an authentic and meaningful um, and, and feel included, right? It's one thing to have a seat at the table. It's another to feel like your voice is actually heard and matters um, and you have a, a seat, an equal seat at the table to everybody else um, that comes from a state agency or from the legislature or whatnot. Um, and working with community-based organizations to really I, you know, help 
arm these individuals and these organizations with the information that they need to, to fully participate. Um, we still do a lot of focus groups and listening sessions, but I think it's it's important for these statewide um, policymakers um, to to hear directly from young people. It's not enough for us to just translate stories and experiences and recommendations, but having um, back and forth between these state policymakers and other task force members and youth and families and communities that are most impacted by the system and will be impacted by any policy change, really engage in meaningful dialogue um, that is at regular intervals. It's not just a one time, okay, you heard me, but also we're gonna come back to you. We're gonna bounce things off of you. We're gonna make sure that the things that we're trying to do resonate and, and will have a meaningful impact and are implemented in a way that, that I think James said earlier too, like does no harm at the very, at the very minimum, right? Um, the other thing is, um, uh, communication strategies. How do we provide um, information, data, um, et cetera, to community leaders, to youth and families so that they can use that information to advocate as well? Um, so, you know, it's one thing to work with statewide organizations or even um, advocacy organizations, but actually um, arming communities and local leaders, um, faith-based leaders, youth and families themselves with information that they can then use to advocate for meaningful changes in the, in the justice system and, and more broadly across other service systems. Um, I think the other thing is, is thinking about policy change, not just from statutory legislative changes, um, but how do agency policies impact disparities as well? And, and trying to do a review of agency policies with a race equity lens or with a community centered lens. Um, what are the hiring practices? What do staffing uh, protocols look like? Or, or who is on the staff of, of a lot of these agencies and, and providers? Um, procurement policies and, and um, resource allocation decisions, looking at those policies with a race equity uh, community lens. How are those procurement RFPs, et cetera? Um, what impact is in terms of the current way that those RFPs or procurement um, protocols, um, what, what, how could they be improved, right? To, to diversify who we're funding and how they could impact um, community of colors. Looking at administrative rules and court rules and regulations with that kind of lens as well is something that we're, we're now trying to do to better center communities and to make sure that we're trying to address disparities in a way that's broader than just legislative initiatives, which can provide broad parameters, but I don't think can get at the, at the real issues that, that, that we're talking about. Um, and then the last piece is what I mentioned around evidence-based practices and, and trying to evaluate and make sure that the evidence-based practices that we're implementing in states and counties around the country are actually adaptive to different communities um, and actually work in different communities because a lot of the research that's been done on these evidence-based practices have not been done on, in diverse communities. They've been done mostly with, with white youth. So making sure that we have that, that knowledge available and that we're trying to adapt and innovate and, and evaluate how those, how those programs actually work on the ground. Yeah, and, and, and Nina reminded me of, of two other things that I've been thinking about a lot is, you know, I, I talk a lot about the participants, but also, you know, when are we not the right people to be doing this work? And who are the community-based organizations, the black and brown run community-based organizations that's been there a long time? How do we support them and train them up to be, to understand the importance of collection of data, interpreting data? What does that look like? How do they tell the story? And I, I will just say for, you know, we're starting a new project in Far Rockaway, Queens. And one of the first things we've done is we've hired young people and trained them up on to how to do participatory justice and research. And their job is to identify with young people through focus groups, through walking around the neighborhood, through asking questions, for them to really understand what are the dilemmas and challenges that are facing the young people in the community, but also recommendations of solutions that they want to put forward. But one of the keys that we've identified is if we are really being honest about reducing the use of our systems, then that system has to be able to reinvest in the young people who are willing to tackle public safety issues by being agents of change. And so every one of the programming that I described, young people are being paid to solve local challenges. 
because clearly government has failed and and identifying that it's a job and an expertise versus we're just seeking your input. Thank you both. Um, with the time remaining, I want to turn to some of the questions uh, that have been submitted by members of the audience. And uh, you all are welcome to continue submitting questions in, in the Q&A portion. <clears throat> but before that, I, I want to just briefly acknowledge uh, Raquel Mariscal and Erica Nowakowski, um, who unfortunately had a, a few technical uh, hiccups and, and weren't un unable to participate in, in the conversation right now, but were inc incredibly helpful and in, in contributing to the, the framing and the questions of this dialogue. So I did want to acknowledge uh, their contributions. Uh, so one one question that was elevated here in the chat is, uh, you know, Latinos represent uh, substantially the, uh, a, a larger portion of the of young people in the country in, in many states and, and, and nationally, right? And so uh, how are robust reform efforts that you all are seeing in the field impacting Latinx youth specifically compared to uh, other racial groups and, uh, and demographic groups, just given that uh, much of the evidence that often uh, has led to previous reforms, has, has uh, been sort of focused on a white black binary. So how, how do we make space for uh, Latino youth, API youth in this conversation around youth justice reform? You know, it's it's really interesting in New York because I feel like there's, when we, when we think about the Latino youth, we think about, you know, uh, we have a large number of Puerto Ricans who are already American citizens. We have Dominicans who've been here for multiple generations. And then we have communities that are newer communities, immigrant communities, and those challenges are so, so different. Um, and so a lot of our folks who've been in New York City for a long period of time, they've been dealing with kind of this generational poverty. And really a lot of what we've been talking about on that end is this idea around economic mobility and some of the earlier programs I was talking about. On, on, the, on the side where we have a lot of young people living in shadows of undoc they're undocumented, it's been increasingly more difficult because any interaction with a system creates a lot of tension. Um, and it's also where we see a more of a rise in click sets and crews and, and, and those kind of challenges. So, you know, it's, it's not across the board and each one of our neighborhoods, we're tackling stuff very differently. So in Sunset Park, where we're having, we have a more of a central American um, population, we are doing a lot more around kind of peacemaking, uh, community, uh, community healing, trying to organize around immigrant populations coming to, to, to New York City. But where we, in other neighborhoods where it's mostly uh, Puerto Rican and Dominican, we find ourselves running programming that is really about interrupting this longstanding kind of challenges of economic mobility. So there, there is no one way that we're dealing with it because each one of our, our Latino communities are very different in the challenges that their families are dealing with. Yeah, I'm trying to think how much I have to add to, to what James said about that. I mean, I think um, one thing that we have noticed, obviously, in the work that we do collecting and looking at data and systems as a whole is just the lack of information um, that's available in, in terms of data about how this population interacts with the justice system and impacts of the justice system and a lack of a research agenda across the country, I think, in terms of what works and what would be helpful um, to disrupt interaction with the justice system and, and get better outcomes for um, Latino youth, um, you know, from different um, uh, communities or populations. Um, I think because of that, um, you know, a lot of the approaches that we have seen, unfortunately, take a much broader um, approach, right? They, they think about how do we reduce the use of the justice system as a whole, and then indirectly that means that, you know, Latino youth or, or other communities are going to be impacted as well. And, and what we know is that's not true, right? The system has shrunk at every level across the country and every state, and yet disparities are still existent, um, and in some cases even bigger. So um, I think, you know, the, the lack of data and the lack of research has been a, a continual challenge in trying to persuade or think about different solutions that, that policymakers um, will adopt um, that can target that, that population. Um, I think it also depends on the state that you're working in and what the population looks like. I mean, so um, 
we did do some work in, in California and in, in, um, at the county levels, obviously, where the population of Latino youth is, is, is a higher percentage than in some of the other states or jurisdictions that we've worked in. Um, and one example there in, in Sonoma County is that they really tried to establish um, diversion programs at the law enforcement level, um, you know, understanding that a lot of youth come into contact with the system in the community, um, you know, outside of school hours for various types of behavior, um, whether that is, you know, weapons or um, drugs or whatnot, and, and some just adolescent behavior. But how can law enforcement um, interact with young people in a different way um, and have options available to them besides bringing them into the detention center and into the justice system? And so how can they expand those opportunities but also create programs that are targeting particular populations. Um, again, I think it's really hard, it was hard for them to identify what that is, um, but a lot of it centered around, um, uh, you know, mitigating violence, mitigating, you know, weapons and, and gun type offenses. Um, obviously gang involvement was a huge thing um, in, in, in that part of the country. Um, although I will say that in other parts of the country, that's the perceived thing is weapons and, and gang involvement, and that's not accurate. And that's why I think having the data is really important to show that. Um, but unfortunately, I think I have fewer answers and more questions um, that need to be answered. We have about five minutes left in the conversation, and I, I did want to have some closing remarks just to help transition our guests. But uh, with the last maybe two or three minutes here, I would love to hear from you both. Uh, maybe one one aspect of uh, this work in the youth justice movement that you are looking forward to uh, in this coming year, be it a campaign, an initiative, uh, a legislative proposal that is gaining traction that you would uh, want to highlight for our audience today. And we can start with Nina. Um, sure. I think, you know, the example that I have right now, so we are, we're working really closely in Indiana. We have a bill that was just passed out of committee yesterday unanimously. Um, you know, Indiana is not thought of as the most progressive on criminal and juvenile justice issues. Um, it's obviously a very conservative state. Um, and I think we've been able to, to make a lot of traction um, by um, including different voices in the process, um, by looking at research um, and data and, and, and what we know works. Um, and also thinking about what narrative are we telling, right? What, what are we using to inform policymakers to make these different types of decisions? And I think that the narrative that we use in Indiana is very different than the narrative that we might use in a state like Connecticut or Massachusetts. And I think that's really important for people to understand and recognize. We're obviously a nonpartisan organization. We work in very different states with very different political ideologies and persuasions. And um, thinking about public safety and resource efficiency um, has been really critical in a state like Indiana, um, you know, compared to when we worked in, in Connecticut, and I'll give Erica another shout out, you know, you don't have to do as much work in terms of changing hearts and minds, right? And, you know, it's more about um, going that next level deeper, right? And, and, and you don't have to have that kind of narrative about public safety as much as, I mean, although they are right now, but um, at that time, um, as you do in, in other more uh, conservative jurisdictions. So I would just like to, to plug Indiana for being able to make that kind of um, change and overcome some of those challenges. And um, just thinking about how you approach different audiences, different policymakers, um, you might not be using the same type of argument, but I think the outcome at the end can look very similar. You know, I, I love how you talk about narrative because, you know, there's a lot of words that are used in, in our system right now. To, the big one is 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 being upstream, you know, going upstream and, and catching young people at the earliest stages, you know, furthest from the system. And and it sounds good in theory, if, but without investment, it's just in theory. Um, and, I, and I think going back to how like what is the meaningful programming that's going to be put in place that if we're going to reduce the budgets of our criminal legal system, how is that reinvested in the preventative programming? And so there's a lot of there's a lot of language around all, you know, around that right now. The question does become are our government willing to uh, reallocate certain budgets 
to to really double down on prevention. And I, I think that's going to we'll see where the rubber hits the road. Um, and, and, and frankly, you know, going back to the data question, you know, data is interesting because, you know, n- numbers, numbers, people tell stories with numbers and, you know, there's a spike in shootings and this in New York. You know, when I was a kid in New York, there was almost 2,500 murders and last year was, you know, 300. And yeah, was it up from the year before? You know, any murder is one too many. But but I also feel like we have to be talking about all the things in our systems that are actually have improved. And because otherwise, what, what I mentioned earlier is pendulum swing and pendulums are driven by fear and fear will drive a more uh, a, a police force that's more aggressive. You'll have more folks coming into prosecutor's office who are talking about being hard on crime. And I can't believe that, you know, some some rhetoric around broken window theories have been coming back again. Um, you know, things that I grew up with in the 1990s as a way we wanted to solve this. We also re- we also realize the amount of harm that it's caused. So so as people are talking about policies, it's really making sure that we collectively are filling the vacuum with things that are going to work. So when somebody does bail reform, we actually have ways that are going to support the individual, but keep community safe because a failure to do one or the other is going to wind up hurting, you know, biting us in the ass. <laughs> well, I want to thank you, uh, James and Nina, for, for spending the hour with us and, and sharing some really uh, tremendous insights with the audience. Um, and for those who are uh, joining us today, I also wanted to plug that we will be having a breakout session at noon Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern time to continue this conversation. Uh, the panel and the conference as a whole is going to be focused on culminating many of these shared legislative strategies and proposals and campaigns into a uniform priority pol- a policy priorities document that will help continue to inform this work ongoing in jurisdictions across the country. So we invite you to join the Youth uh, Justice Breakout Session uh, today um, at noon, and we will continue this conversation. I would love to hear directly from you all, the, the amazing work that you are you all are doing in your home communities. Uh, and next up, we will be having the uh, main stage plenary discussion on challenges in reintegration. Uh, and to navigate back there, you can go just right back to the reception area and we'll see the main stage uh, up live now and you are welcome to join. So thank you all again and I hope you have a great rest of your convening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone.